It's three years after the defeat of Nazi Germany, 1948. In a courtroom in Germany, psychiatric nurse Paulina Kneisler is on trial. A witness testifies against her. He says, Paulina Kneisler greeted me very warmly, and one comes away saying, oh, that's a fine nurse. She's taking splendid care of my mother. But, he said, in doing so, she was the murderer of my mother. Paulina Kneisler was found guilty of this murder and hundreds of others in mental health facilities across Germany. She murdered her patients willingly as a nurse who bought into Nazi ideology at its core. But why? From the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, this is 12 years that shook the world. I'm Erin Harper. Paulina Kneisler was born and raised in the Russian Empire. She came from a wealthy family with German roots. Her father managed a large estate and provided Paulina with a private tutor. But after the rise of communism, the newly formed Soviet Union government threatened violence against the wealthy and stripped Paulina's family of their money. With nothing left, they fled. Paulina and her family moved to Germany to try to rebuild a new life. They end up in Germany and she has to go to work. That's Dr. Patricia Haberer Rice, senior historian of the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the museum. She becomes a nurse, and all her life she's wanted to be a pediatric nurse. Paulina finds work as a pediatric nurse at a prestigious institution in Germany. But a few years later, with state spending cuts, Paulina loses her position. She transfers to a mental health facility. She becomes a psychiatric nurse. And so she's not altogether happy with this, but she has to make money. She obviously has her goals set on being a very good nurse. By now in the late 1920s, the Nazi party is gaining popularity in Germany. And it appeals to Paulina because it promises hope and a new beginning for Germany, a country struggling to recover from the First World War. And the Nazis, like Paulina, are anti-communist. So Paulina joins the Nazi party and later becomes a leader in a Nazi women's organization. By the time World War II begins, Paulina has been working as a psychiatric nurse at German facilities for more than a decade. But her life is about to take a significant turn when she gets an invitation from Nazi administrators. In December of 1939, Paulina is summoned to Berlin, where administrators inform this handful of basically young female nurses, that there's this new government program that's going to grant a mercy death to seriously ill and suffering patients. The Nazis' systematic murder of European Jews was not the regime's only program of mass murder. In 1939, the Nazis secretly begin this program, called T4, named after the address of the program's office in Berlin. The T4 program is one of the many radical measures that the Nazis undertook to restore what they understood to be the racial integrity of the German nation. And it targets for killing mentally and physically disabled patients housed in institutions throughout Germany and in German and ex territories. People who had uh, some severe intellectual or developmental disability, a severe physical disability, or incurable mental illness who were seen to pose both a genetic as well as a financial burden upon the society and the state. For example, a mother of three who was diagnosed with epilepsy, a three-year-old girl with an intellectual disability, and a middle-aged man with bipolar disorder. The Nazis believed these people posed a threat to the Nazis' idea of a pure German race. Really what's happening is beginning in 1940, patients begin to be removed from their home institutions and taken to one of six killing centers throughout Germany and Austria. And within uh, hours of their arrival at one of these facilities, they're gassed in specially designed gas chambers, and they are cremated in special crematory ovens. After being summoned and briefed on the T4 program, Paulina Kneisler accepts the role in the killing operation. She's sworn to secrecy. Paulina's initial responsibility in the program is to help transport victims to T4 facilities, about 70 people per day. She also prepares patients, undresses them, and escorts them to the gas chambers. We should be clear that at this stage, nurses did not murder patients. They're really playing a supporting role. A physician 
usually facilitated the gassing. So at this point, she's an accessory to murder. Despite the fact that the Nazis tried to keep this mass murder program a secret, word got out. Some German citizens and clergy protested. So in mid-1941, the Nazis paused the T4 program for about a year. But in this time period, Paulina Kneisler's next activity was perhaps her turning point. Paulina joined in an activity that's been shrouded in mystery for us. In the winter months of 1942, she's asked, along with other T4 staff, to volunteer for a secret mission in the East, which they called the Eastern Mission. By this time in the East, German soldiers had invaded the Soviet Union in World War II. According to post-war hearsay testimony from Paulina's colleague, Paulina allegedly said the goal of this Eastern mission was to murder wounded German soldiers on the front. Soldiers who were suffering from severe head trauma or psychiatric disorders manifested from war trauma. Paulina tells her colleague that she especially, quote, regretted giving injections at a reserve military hospital in Russia from which the soldiers died painlessly, end quote. Now this is hearsay testimony. We don't know if it's true. But if it is, this is where Paulina crosses the line, going from being an accessory to murder to killing with her own hands. After participating in the Eastern Mission, Paulina Kneisler returns to nursing in Germany. By this time, the T4 program is operating again, and medical professionals at a mental health facility called Kaufbaren have started murdering patients. Kaufbaren sits in the hills of the German countryside. Inside, rows of small beds are spaced just a few feet apart. Young patients lie in their beds, and older patients play board games at a table. Outside, a patient roams the grass with a cat in her arms, and nurses watch over. The facility also has an annex building about a half mile away, and there, gray buses are arriving, full of new patients. The staff puts them into little rooms in the facility. One by one, the patients disappear, and soon, another bus arrives with more patients. By this time in the T4 program, nurses have started murdering patients by lethal overdoses of medication, like luminol or morphine. And in 1944, Paulina Kneisler is sent to work in the women's ward. When Paulina Kneisler begins to work in the women's ward, at Kaufborn, the mortality rate soars. She murdered patients by administering lethal overdoses of medication. We don't know how many persons she actually murdered, but it must have been in the hundreds. And she's typically killing people on the night shift. It looks very normal to kill people in the evening before they go to sleep for the evening. These are psychiatric patients. Some of them are very restless. And so it looks very ordinary and common to give these individuals medication for them to get some rest. Then Paulina begins work in the annex building at Kaufbaren, and there is a young boy named Ernst. He's 14 and was sent to Kaufbaren a few years prior after a state psychiatrist labeled him a psychopath. And one night in August of 1944, Paulina Kneisler visits Ernst during her shift. She administers Ernst an injection, a lethal dose of morphine. Ernst falls into a deep sleep. Shortly after, Ernst is found dead. Paulina took Ernst's life, but his story would serve as evidence in the murder of German patients at the hands of medical professionals. After the defeat of Nazi Germany, Ernst's fate was taken up by American prosecutors in the Nuremberg doctors' trial. In this trial, 23 leading German physicians and administrators were tried for their participation in this program and other crimes. Many were found guilty. And Paulina Kneisler faced her own trial in the newly reconstructed criminal courts after the war. She's, of course, complicit in all these thousands of murders, and she freely admits this. Paulina Kneisler is sentenced ultimately to four years in prison, of which she serves three and a half years. And following her release, she immediately gets a nursing position in West Germany, uh, at a relatively well-known mental health facility. And she's pensioned in 1963 with a state pension. Living that full life while she took the lives of so many. You might imagine that Paulina Kneisler and these other medical professionals were forced to murder their patients, but that's not the case. 
Early on in the T4 program, many doctors and nurses were given a choice. In her post-war interrogation by U.S. Army war crimes investigators, Paulina Kneisler said, it was completely voluntary. Most of them concurred in the post-war that they had encountered really no overt pressure to commit to this program. Paulina Kneisler, though, is one of the only T4 nurses in the post-war who is really clear on this point. She says, we nurses were sworn to secrecy, and then we're informed of this uh, program, and we're simply given a few minutes to reflect on whether we'd like to participate or not. And she says, we didn't feel very good about it, but we had no moral reservations. And all of these young women said yes. So many of the individuals who are recruited are people who've just shown their reliability to the party and to its ideology. And she's politically reliable and she's politically convinced. And that's why Paulina shows up in Berlin in 1939 and she's recruited for this program. It's impossible to know why exactly Paulina Kneisler bought into Nazi ideology and why she chose to kill for its cause. Was it her drive to become a nurse at any cost? Was she running from the political turmoil that stripped her of her wealth? Or was she looking for something to believe in? Paulina Kneisler was not alone in her choice. Several hundred other medical professionals participated in the T4 killing program in some fashion. And after the war, many also served minimal prison sentences and returned to their role as medical professionals. In total, they claimed the lives of about a quarter million people, both children and adults. In Germany, patients' medical files are sealed after their death. So today, we still don't know the identity of many T4 victims. There's a growing will in Germany to name the victims of this program, but there are still significant legal challenges. From the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, this is 12 years that shook the world. I'm Erin Harper. Joining us today was Dr. Patricia Haberer Rice, Senior Historian of the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the museum. Our story is informed by the work of Dr. Michael Von Kronick. Our show is produced by myself. Our stories are researched by Meredith Gway. This podcast is funded in part by support from the Crown Family Philanthropies and from Laura Ginz and family. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Tell us what you think of the episode. Send an email to podcast at ushmm.org or talk to us on social media. We are at Holocaust Museum. If you love our show, please follow us on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening.